Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. We've got a really exciting, fabulous show lined up for you that's going to take us back to kind of our roots. We're going to talk tonight about cloak craft, things in the sky, um, some aspects of the paranormal related to, um, let's just say, what sits behind the frames of our reality stream right now. And um, I just want to take a minute here to encourage you to uh, visit the website if you're watching this on YouTube, offplanetradio.com. Go over there. That's how you can keep up with what we're doing. Not everything is on YouTube these days. Emily, tell us about our guests and our show tonight. All right. So we have uh, back joining us again, uh, one of our favorites, Sean Gatro. You know him. He's the guy with the eyes to see. He's, uh, in my opinion, document done the most documentation of the bizarre phenomenon of cloak cloudcraft. Uh, above us, and uh, he's an, also an artist and an all-around awesome guy, so we're happy to have him back with us, and he's brought his friend along this evening, and uh, so our second guest is a retired police officer with an extensive background in criminal investigations, owns a family business in uh, law enforcement supply, and has have had a long-time interest in the UFO subject since his first sighting of an illuminated disc in Santa Monica Bay in 1973. Uh, in 2011, he took interest in chemtrails and began filming and documenting the skies over the Antelope Valley, California, in hopes of spreading awareness to the chemtrail agenda. Within a short time, he began capturing strange anomalies in the sky that appeared to have a connection to chemtrails. Anomalies consisted of man-made cloud experiments, possibly connected to harp-type technology, numerous sightings of UFOs, signatures of cloak craft, visible disc-shaped objects and orbs that have a strange attraction to chemtrails chemtrail spray and more since the 1970s he's had experience in photography film video and astronomy jim care welcome to off planet radio is it kerr or care it's kerr kerr sorry jim kerr <laughs> there we go thank you for having me on absolutely all right guys so we're in for a treat today guys um we're just gonna let sean and jim school us on before all of the we, uh, before we oh, launch in here oh, sorry. Next. Let's um, every get Sean and Jim to both give out their website so we have that okay. out of the way at the front end. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'll go ahead. Um, my I really uh, direct people to my YouTube channel, which is Industrial Surrealism, is the channel name, and the series is called "What Is in Our Skies," uh, and recently renamed to "Who What Is in Our Skies." And I'm. Uh, my own, my real own, only public exposure would be on the uh, Roxy Lopez's website called the Truth com, and if you go to the Truth dot com and just uh, punch in the search Jim Kerr K E R R, it'll come up with all the articles uh, that I've written for uh, for her online uh, yeah. website with photos and videos and that. We'll put links up for all of this. Um, thanks, guys, for sharing that so people know where they can find you. All right, so we're in for a treat. The guys are just going to totally uh, geek out on all the anomalies going on above us in the sky. So take it away, guys. Jimmy, you want to start? Okay. Um, you know, back in, uh, well, like in the bio, you know, my first sighting of a wild anomaly was in 1973 over the Santa Monica Bay. And it's a sighting of a uh, aluminum disc that I will never forget as long as I live. And uh, it was uh, also, and it was so fast, you know, it was hovering about 500 feet off the water, uh, probably about a half mile out for about five minutes. And uh, when it shot up into the atmosphere and vanished, had you blinked your eyes, you would have missed it. And what confirmed the sighting even more was 10 minutes later, there was three uh, F-4 Phantoms. Uh, probably from Magoo Air Base over the water looking for something. Um, since that time, you know, I've had a couple other sightings. 
But in uh, 2011, you know, I took a interest in chemtrails. Now I had heard about chemtrails in the in the 90s, in the late 90s, but just never really took the time to investigate it for myself. But well, starting in 2011, you know, I uh, did a lot of documentation research, patent research, pretty much everything that any uh, research of the subject would do as far as as far as uh, you know investigation. You know, then also, you know, hundreds of hours of video footage. And uh, that led to uh, capturing uh, some strange anomalies in the sky. Uh, more UFOs, more disks for sure, you know, were captured, orbs. Uh, then I, you know, I was seeing these, what almost looked like uh, images of triangular objects in the sky, you know, usually in and around clouds. Uh, chemtrails seem to be attracted to these things. You know, chemtrails would spray near these these images. And, uh, you know, it was something that, you know, just my gut told me that there's something here. There's something to this. And, you know, I, I didn't, and then around the summer of 2012, you know, I was just going through YouTube and I ran across Sean's uh, YouTube channel, Industrial Surrealism. And it was about that time, around that time that he had posted uh, maybe his first or second video on the subject. And I was looking and listening to what he was saying about this thing. And I was saying, man, you know, this is exactly, you know, what I'm seeing in the skies over the Antelope Valley, California, you know, and, uh, you know, in our area here, you know, Emily's quite aware of the Antelope Valley you know, it's probably one of the, it's a huge hub for the military industrial complex. I mean, we've got NASA, Northrop, uh, Skunk Works, Edwards Air Force Base, and there's a slew of other like black budget military bases scattered throughout the high desert here. But it was that time, you know, I said, you know, I've got to, I've got to contact Sean Gutro. You know, so I uh, emailed him uh, or messaged him through, uh, through uh, YouTube. We exchanged emails, we exchanged phone numbers, and boy, we were off to the races after that. You know, we spent many, many hours on the phone talking with each other, you know, sharing information. Um, you know, then over the years, you know, this is back in 20, 2012, uh, you know, we became good friends, you know, over, uh, you know, over the subject of cloud craft. Uh, we've exchanged many, many different theories, you know, we've bounced all over the map as far as theories go. Uh, you know, the, you know, I'll find. I used to find something on the internet that was had to do with cloaking. You know, uh, you know, technology. I emailed to him. He'd he'd send emails back to me, and uh, you know, him and I just hit it off really, really well. And uh, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. I really like Sean, and uh, he's got a, a wealth of information to share. Well, thanks, Jim. Right back at you, man. And and that's exactly what happened. It's um. You were a godsend, and when when I was lost uh, putting out these videos, if there wasn't much info out there, and, and there still isn't really, but um, having you contact me and, and, again, being able to bounce things off of each other and, and trade ideas and does this work, does this not work, um, has has been great, and um, it gave me a little bit of sanity in, in the sea of insanity. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Uh, the... Jim and I came across this uh, these anomalies about the same time, and I'm you know almost uh, six years into it I guess, and it was really uh, noticing the weather and uh, New Orleanians really notice the weather a lot because we get a lot of strong storms so we we pay attention, and um, we were having some some really strange droughts and uh, storms that would normally come up from the south out of the Gulf of Mexico over New Orleans uh, almost daily at about 2 p.m. Uh, weren't coming this far north. And I could see them because I can see over the Gulf. I'm, I'm not too far away. Uh, and these clouds would come up and just stop and just drop all their energy along this line, which was about 15 miles, 20 miles south of here. And it, it was happening uh, consistently. So I went to radar and started watching radar and, and it confirmed that these things were, were stopping. We weren't getting the rain here, but everything was stopping 15, 20 miles south, um, which really uh, piqued my interest. So I ended up buying a couple of cheap HD cameras and setting those up 
I'm starting to record, and that's when I started getting uh, recording a lightning. Uh, storms actually reach in the area uh, in different weather patterns, and, and I was intrigued. So um, it, it went from there, but uh, like Jim was saying, the same thing happened to me. I just started noticing there were things in there that didn't make any sense. These uh, light, fluffy, uh, billowing clouds were uh, not necessarily that anymore, and, and the shapes started to emerge. And I started noticing the straight lines and then the triangular shapes and the exhaust patterns and everything else. And um, so the more I recorded, the more it was apparent when I bring it into the computer and, and uh, scroll it up fast or, or whatever, speed it up. Uh, but it was really August 8th, uh, 2011, when I had my first sighting, a definite sighting. And the thing is, I... I had already set up the camera. I was uh, recording something that was way up, probably 30,000 feet, uh, some, some anomalies up there. And then this thing just appeared in front of the lens. And I turned around and I saw it. And it was, a, it was half in, half out. It was a diamond shape. It was dark color. Uh, what the camera didn't pick up was a shadow that it was casting onto the, what I call now, just essentially plasma, which is charged gas. Um, uh, on this side of it and uh, it sat up there for about five minutes and at that point uh, it kind of confirmed what I was what I was guessing at uh, for a few months um, so yeah that's what drug me into it well then you know we you know of course you know Sean and I had talked about a lot of this you know that he just mentioned and uh, you know you know I started seeing you know, the actual formation, you know, that you would have like a clear blue sky, you know, not a cloud in the sky, uh, you know, no chemtrails, you know, just a beautiful blue sky. And all of a sudden, you would see this small dot, you know, that was like a whitish dot. And it would literally explode into like this cloud formation. Uh, and, you know, you know, most people have seen natural clouds form. And you can see them form you know, like, you know, on the other side of a mountain, you know, with a mountain range behind it. Uh, and, you know, it's a slow process, you know, but, you know, you don't see a cloud go from, say, you know, the size of a, the, of a pea, you know, you have like a green pea held at arm's length. You know, you see this little cloud up there and all of a sudden in seconds, this thing literally explodes and expands into this, you know, massive cloud formation. And then you start seeing these dark objects inside the cloud, like shadows, you know, with geometric shapes, you know, and you actually start seeing these shadows, you know, like triangular shadows moving around inside the cloud. Uh, one in particular um, that, you know, I've got video footage. Maybe I could, uh, maybe I could, maybe I, uh, you know, if I can try to, ski, you know, screencast this. I mean, this is just, it's crazy, crazy footage. Um, Just like I showed you the green screen share at the bottom. Yeah. Let's see if this is going to work for me. Those P, those P's that you're talking about, I recently. Um, was out with a friend who was a forager on a little mm -hmm. class she was giving and we were very close to JPL and I saw uh, me and the whole class saw numerous times that happened these little sort of silvery white dots kind of break apart into these weird formations and structures is this is it can you see the video footage right now yep okay now let me just pause this for a second give a quick quick backstory on this I walked out of my shop and I've got a ranch, a small ranch, you know, outside of town, outside of the, the city of Palmdale, Lancaster. And uh, I walked, you know, so I do all my business off my property. I've got a, a shop. I walked out of the shop and that's when I saw this cloud, the P side explode, ran in, got the camcorder. And this is where I pick up once I get the camcorder, this thing has already expanded. Now, if you look right here at this triangular object, this dark shadow, you can see other dark geometric shapes within this. Now this thing just exploded like crazy. And so I'm gonna turn on, now keep your eye on this one on top up here and watch how it turns and goes down into the cloud. This is all real time footage, you know, it's not speeded up or anything like that. 
and it just vanishes in the cloud. And over here to the left, you can see another object. So basically, what these what these craft will do, or these objects will do, will expel a cloud-like material. And within this material, a lot of times you can see the images of them. You could see uh, something that may even look like a smoke blast effect. Mm. You know, I, I've got some other photos. That's pretty dramatic. Show, wow. You know, and you know, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead a little farther on this with contrast added to the uh, footage. Okay, here's the footage with contrast. You can see the wow. the objects. Now watch that one on top. That thing just takes a nosedive down into that cloud. And now, you know, like I said, this thing puffed up or expanded at such a rate, it was unbelievable. And then at the end of this, whatever these objects are, it's almost like they vacuumed up the cloud material after this was done. Yeah. You know, after they were done doing the seeds. Yes. You can see something to the left here too. You know, I'm, I'm gonna go a little head, a little further ahead so we can make this a little shorter. right about here is when it starts to dissipate and literally this thing is vacuuming up this cloud material and uh, you know once the cloud is gone or this material is gone you see no traces you know of these triangular or geometric shapes anymore but uh, and, and this is not the first time that I've seen this this is one of the best captures I've had of it but you know, wow! It's it, and this is real time. You see how fast that disappeared? I mean, yeah. it's like this thing vacuumed up, sucked up all this material, and they're gone. You know, I mean, it's just uh, it, it's unbelievable. And, and you know, you, you know, you, you tell people about this, and they just they can't grasp, you know, what is happening here. Uh, and there, you could see that one that took the nose dive into the cloud there. Yeah, this is almost exactly what I saw that day at, we were at, I can't remember the name of the place, I'll have to ask my friend, but it was in Pasadena, like there was a park, and it was just over the hill from JPL, and that's almost exactly what we saw. Uh-huh. Yeah. Try to get out of here. You should have a menu at the top of your screen that'll let you bounce out of that. Got it. There you go. All right. That was dramatic. Um... You know, it, looking at that, you have to ask yourself, what did I just see there and what purpose did it serve? I mean, it expanded itself in, cloaked itself in this cloud, expands this thing, does these maneuvers inside of it, and then it sucks up this material and disappears in front of your eyes. I'm... And yeah, it, it, it's mind blowing, you know. But this is a common um, thing with these clouds, you know, with, with these with these craft and that. And interesting enough, this was actually I filmed this at quite a distance, and it was actually over the El Mirage Dry Lake bed. And out in that area, there is a government contractor operation out there that builds drones for the government. Now, I can't say 100% that that footage was associated with that company, but they build drones out there. And, and what's interesting is, you know, over the years of living out here, you know, I've met a lot of people uh, within the military industrial complex. Now, I've had, com I've had conversations with them and some of the things that you now none of them have actually have come out and said, uh, "Yeah, you know, we have this technology." Uh, the, usually, the comments I get. In fact, the one told me uh, he just looked at me, kind of smiled, and said, uh, "What we have is beyond science fiction." You know, and I'm talking about people that that you know are high up in Northrop. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, Skunk Works. You know, uh, Edward Edwards Air Force Base. You know, people that I've met, and uh, in fact, my my daughter was even dating somebody who worked for Northrop, that uh, 
you know, I showed some of this footage too, and he just basically smiled, you know, so. Wow. Yeah. Sean, what do you think? Am I still muted? No, oh, here I am. Okay. Here you are. Um, yeah. I mean, that's it. And, and, and Jim described it uh, perfectly because it's an easy way to see these things if you just sit outside for a couple of minutes and you're watching the clouds pass by. And what you expect to be a random clump of moisture um, going from to uh, you know from horizon to horizon is is not the case. And they will just appear out of nowhere, puff up, and within you know sometimes under a minute it's gone. History. Mm. And. Um, it's it's an easy way to, as I said, sit out there and pick this up. And a lot of people have seen this. They, they've seen different things. They've seen the shadows. They've seen the sharp edges. And they've seen this kind of thing. And, and this is very telltale um, about whatever they, they may be. So, um, yeah. Now, are we going to a place here where we believe that this is, A, some type of military-grade craft cloaking technology B that this is weather modification being tested or C that you're seeing a cycle of cause and effect where the cloud forms and this craft enters into it and then sucks this. Now I've seen the, 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 the chemtrail sucking here and this is really hard to explain except that I have watched these giant round clouds that have the sh and in fact i need to take some of my own pictures and do what you guys have done because i've been recording it but i've noticed that we would have a sky full of chemtrails but as these things came in they would begin to dissipate the chemtrails around them so i'm wondering are, are is it any all or a combination of those those three things and, and all of this is speculation so nobody's Reputation goes on the line here. All and more, I'd say. Oh, great. Off, answer, answer four of three. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if y'all have had uh, Alana Freeland on. Yes. Yeah, yeah we yeah, have too. Yeah. So she uh, kind of lines out the seven uh, phases or, or whatever operations, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it goes beyond uh, that. And you know, at the beginning, I was, I, I was thinking military. Because I wasn't really into the whole UFO thing. I was a bit, but not a lot. And I'm like, oh, you know, especially after August 8th, I'm like, this has got to be some kind of military craft. So I started looking into cloaking, and that made sense. Um, and they do have the cloaking. We've seen some things. We haven't seen it all. But uh, the, the technology's there, whether it's just simply a cloak blimp or it's a construct of nanoparticles um, and nanotechnology. I mean, it can be done. Two, um, I, go, go ahead. ahead. No, nope. go ahead, Sean. No, so I started thinking, uh, all right, because people were telling me, oh, it's aliens and it's an alien invasion. I started looking into that. And at the time, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a year into this maybe. And well, well could it could it be? And the information wasn't coming back from, from the research to say yes or no. So I was kind of drifting in and out of Project Blue Beam. Um, and is it a possibility? Um, can it be done? Yes, it it can be done. But then um, again, uh, people are saying it's 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 uh, aliens that are um, benevolent. Uh, well, maybe they're angels, they're demons, they're this, that, and the other, and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, but currently, I'm exploring um, a possibility that is neither um, human or quote alien. And uh, it could be the third option there. And uh, essentially, I think it's all three because they have the cloaking. Um, I do believe that we're being visited here and there. Um, the, the evidence is, is overwhelming. And then the other option of something that's been there the whole time. Uh, but coming back to chemtrails, if, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, Randy, or, or you, Emily. I know Jim's seen it. But I'd like to do a, a screen share of a video I captured in, I think it's October, 2013. Please. And there's a chemtrail plane coming over and I was uh, videotaping or recording the chemtrails. And then what sucked them in and got rid of a lot of this trail is a, is a brown 
plasma craft and, and one or two orbs below it that were pretty darn big. So um, can I give it a shot? Yeah, go ahead. That green screen share button that I showed you in the beginning. Yep. All right. Yep. Just clicked on that. And let's see if this works. Okay. And yep. I'll maximize it. So, yeah, this is um, 3.49 into the video. I made a video. I didn't even do it that day. I, I, I saw this. I, I recorded it and kind of laughed and came back inside. And then weeks later or possibly months later, I um, – made a video out of it. So this was the chemtrail and I'm pointing out right now, uh, the big craft, which is possible up top. And that's the way it seemed, but especially the smaller one below with the green arrow pointing to it. And that's what okay. I'm going to focus in on, uh, here in a second. So that is a still shot auto levels. Again, a diagramming that I put in there, the dark shapes seem to be the craft of the objects. The blue areas seem to be the exhaust or, or their moat, uh, their patterns, their wakes. And then the video part is this. So the chemtrail is the white area. I know that brown plasma craft in the back. I know what it is. It's a triangle. It's pointing those up. And the chemtrail dissolves into these objects, whatever it may be. So. Wow. Huh. And I've also got these things uh, darting across the screen. I don't know what they are, the little white things. I zoom out, and it shows you how far away it actually was. It, it was up there. It was good. Um, it wasn't long after the plane had sprayed, and the plane was maybe 20,000, 30,000 feet. So what you're looking at right now is 20 to 30,000 feet up there. Now, when you say these little white things, are, are you saying these are, are like uh, sort of orb-like? The little bitty ones that are that are passing yeah. through. I don't know if you can see this. They could be. They could be bugs. Um, I've captured them in different ways to where sometimes they look like bugs and sometimes they're triangles. Um, in still shots, they look uh, like a, a lavender light, I guess. Uh, that's just the way they show up. So that, one of my favorite videos. That's crazy, though, the way, like, there's the smaller white ball and the bigger one, and then there's that thing that's almost like an umbilical cord that touches it and then starts to shrink away. Like, mm -hmm. that is crazy. Yeah. And that was um, something I had recorded in the past and seen a lot of, theorized on it. Um, and I'm like, this makes a lot of sense. But after that day, this one's so obvious. It's just, boom. It, this object took in that chemtrail. So do, so do you think, I know you and I have talked about this before, do you think that that chemtrail, is, they're trying to clean it up, that it's energy or food for them, or that this is uh, like they're shooting something from one to the other? Like, what, where are you at with that? Well, I've always been, well, not always, but for, for years, is it fuel? Is it midair refueling? Yeah. If it's military, it's uh, midair refueling. If it's not, uh, is, it, is it poison? Are they poisoning these things? Are they controlling the weather? Do they understand weather better than most of us? Yeah, they do. Um, so I've gone back and forth and back and forth, and I think you know it could be both again. If they're military craft up there, this would be a way to refuel. If these are natural things that create the weather and they wanted to control them, yes, they'd have to inject some kind of metallic particle into them, and then uh, that could be controlled by, let's say, radar, next red harp that kind of thing, uh, push them around here and there. So essentially you're controlling the weather. So I want to tell you about, I've been meaning to tell you about this for a while. I don't think I have. I told Jim, I had a very interesting remote view several months back. I was just like laying in bed and all of a sudden I'm somewhere watching this. I'm in a room. It's a dark room. There's people, several people in there. It seemed like a situation or a war kind of room. And I don't know if they were looking at a giant screen in front of them or through some kind of window. But you know those line, the things that are like the sort of angled, they're, they're not horizontal, they're like sort of angled diagonally and they're like spiral, those kind of lines that we see? Okay. So I saw one of those things and I saw one of the triangular or you call them diamond shaped craft falling quickly in one of those sp like spiral kind of trails, right? It like, like, like it was falling very quickly and then all of a sudden it, 
it, when it was it falling quickly, it turned into something else and started like rising again, almost. It like changed its shape and started to rise. And the people that were in the room were like, oh, oh my, like, it was like they were, it, it almost seemed to me like they had thought they had done something to it that would disabled it. And then it like self-corrected or self-fixed itself and it wasn't being brought down. And the way I was watching this go on for a couple of minutes, and you know, like when you're on 4th of July and people are waiting for the next thing to explode and then it doesn't like, oh, like they, they don't know what's going to come next. That was kind of like what it was like in the room, but it was crazy. And it was in, I'd always wondered about those sort of spiral line trail thingies that we see. And it was incredible to see that in there. What, have you seen anything that looks like that? Yeah, all the time. Um, I've seen them evade chemtrails. I've seen them getting targeted by uh, chemtrails. And I've also seen them, cirrus clouds, believe it or not, take a, uh, not a 45, a 90 degree turn towards a chemtrail that has just been laid. So it's like it's um, electrically attracted to it or it's trying to evade it or something. Yeah, yeah. Jim's got a great video of a sprayer going up above with three orbs right behind it that, you know, kind of, it, it's definite. It's there. Jim, you there? Yeah. I you mean, the, the one with the chemtrail jet and the, yep. uh, the three uh, orb-like UFO-type objects that are attracted. So that's the thing with these. And this is so bizarre. You know, when it comes to these chemtrail jets, uh, I have seen more different types of UFOs attracted to chemtrails. Um, you know, they're either a cat. You know, they're either like almost harassing the jet, or they're uh, going in and out of. They're they're interacting with the chemtrail spray for some reason. Now, here I can pull this. This let me see if I can pull this video up here. And you know they. Uh, it's you know it's just such a strange reaction that they have. Um, let's see here. I have to reduce one screen and pop up another one. Then all right. Okay. Now this happens. These things are so fast. You know what? This is the wrong video. But and it doesn't matter. Uh, this is this one here is another UFO. It's attracted. This is in a separate video. Uh, you can see, you know, a lot of people say that that's a bird. Uh, it's later on in the video. You can see. Jim, can you maybe full screen those video? There we go. All right. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I see it. You can see what's now. This is in slow motion. Yeah, it's hard to see in this video, but I actually, you know, dissected the video right, frame by. Frame yep. by frame, yep. And frame by frame, this is actually a disc. It is a, you know, it, it's it's hard to tell from this video footage here. But, uh, now here's one with the contrast adjusted a little bit. You see that curving motion? Now this yeah. is in slow motion. It, at, at regular speed, this thing is so fast. But it was like it was tormenting this jet. I mean, it was all around. Uh, this chemtrail jet, and the jet was an unmarked jet, you know, most likely a military tanker. And most of the UFOs I've seen in and around, you know, military type jets or unmarked, unmarked jets. Now, here, I'll go to the end of this where you could get a really good shot of. Um, let's see, this is it. Down in the bottom left hand corner, you can see it uh, yep. across the screen. That's now that's real, that's yeah. actual speed, you know. Yeah, that's the time. Yeah, that's blink and you miss it speed. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you dissect the frame by frame, you know, with some contrast and maybe some other, uh, you know, lighting effects, you can see that there's actually a disc. And basically, what you're seeing here is an energy field around this object, yeah. around the craft. There's like a, it's giving off energy. And you, can, is, you can see inside of that. There's there's a there's a variation in density of materials there where you can see the field outside of it and the object inside of the field. Exactly. You know, and this is the most common UFO sighting, 
UFO craft that we see here over the Antelope Valley. Now, what's interesting, now this is going to really get wild uh, as far as this craft goes. Um, in the last frames of the video, it's not on here. I left it out of the actual video intentionally. Um, but I actually, while I was filming this, I actually uh, looked up and I saw this object uh, basically went over my head. You know, it, it probably, I, I don't know, a thousand feet. And in the video footage at the tail end, when this thing crossed over, um, the camera captured like a white, cloudy um, substance in front of the camera lens. You know, it was like for, for, a, for a split second as this thing passed over, the camera wasn't capturing anything. Just wow. like a white cloud. Now, here's where it gets really wild. And I can't say 100%. Uh, an hour after I shot this footage, I was rushed to the hospital. My gallbladder exploded. Wow. I, I had to have emergency surgery after. Now, I was engulfed in some sort of energy field. And it was captured on the camera. Now, can I say that this is 100% connected? No, I can't say that. You know, but it was awfully strange that an hour after this, after you know being engulfed in this energy field, that you know basic my gall my gallbladder basically ruptured. And you were feeling fine before that? Perfectly fine, perfectly fine before this. Huh. And 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 really had no history of any problems. You know, and uh, the doctor was just you know baffled you know by it, but. Uh, you know, this is something that happened to me, and I can't say it's connected. You know, but it's awful strange. I wonder. I wonder if there's any like. I wonder if there's a there's people who do some research into physical effects that can be caused by directed energy weapons, and I wonder if there's one that can cause something like a gallbladder explosion. It's really you know, interesting. It, it's possible. I mean, it is really possible. But um, you know, getting back to the the cloak craft. Uh, you know, my my theories, of, like Sean, you know, has bounced all over the map. You know, I mean, everything from military to, uh, you know, extraterrestrial to uh, dimensional, you know, uh, even, you know, even into the demonic realm, you know, and and I'm back again to military application. I don't believe these are solid objects. You know, I have seen. Yeah. I have seen too many times where jets have actually gone straight through these things. Um, I even have, uh, here's, here's, let's see if I can pull up this. You know, I, I just don't believe that they're solid objects. Well, uh, they, they're just too self-transforming. I mean, I've done, sat there with people both in the city and out in, in far out in nature, away from all of the other kinds of bothers and watch them almost put on shows where they transform themselves into, they're almost like self-transforming something or others. And so, you know, something that was solid could not do that. Well, my, my latest theory, and which I've been working on, is it, it, it goes in connection with the U.S. Naval Research Lab's plasma cloud technology. Uh, they, in 2013... Uh, they put out an article, you know, from the U.S. Naval Research Lab, you know, about their plasma cloud technology connected with HARP and ionosphere heaters, you know, where they're able to create what they call a ionospheric uh, mirror or a, uh, a plasma cloud. You know, they call it both. And, you know, what this is used for, and you can look up all the HARP patents. This is in the patents, uh, you know, this technology you know, where they could create this plasma cloud and, you know, basically they could do it any size they want, any size cloud they want. And they can use that for uh, radio communications. They could use that for enhanced radar communications. Um, they can see down into the earth, like a hundred miles into the earth with this technology. Um, they can, you know, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if they could create these, you know, using harp type technology, why not just stop and think about creating a small plasma cloud, any size you want, maybe any shape you want, and they could use it for surveillance. That's what I was going to ask you. You know, they could use it for surveillance. They can listen to a conversation. 
through this, you know, because it, it, it does it does enhance two way communications. Uh, and, and also, and I'm actually I'm working on another article, and I'll be do, and actually Roxy Lopez and I will be doing a documentary film, uh, in which would be a part two to my. I've got one article on her website, you know, the U.S. Uh, Naval Research Plasma Clouds, and the second one is footage of one of these plasma cloud experiments that I captured over the Antelope Valley back in 2012, before the Navy released their information. I had no idea what I was looking at, you know, but um, so I'm thinking now, you know, that it's, it's, it's all, in the, of course, it's all conjecture in the realm of possibility that possibly these craft are uh, being used, you know, for a surveillance. I mean, just think, you know, you, you could yeah. launch, put one of these over enemy territory. You, you could put these over your enemy's, you know, capital and be able to listen to conversations and and and, and capture video through this thing. You know, I mean, the, the uh, it, you know, the technology is endless here. And, you know, it all has, a, you know, it can all be correlated in some sense to, you know, the Navy's technology when it comes to these plasma clouds. And yeah, go ahead. And I think it could be, I mean, you were saying you could put it over your enemy's capital. You could put it over a person's house. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, for, for any purpose you want, you know, and so that's where I'm kind of leaning towards. And it know, can disappear. It can, and it can appear, appear to disappear as soon as somebody notices it. Exactly. So, exactly. so it can be, if they want you to know they're watching, they can be there for a second, but then when you go to show somebody, they can make it disappear. <laughs> to make you see you know, sitting, you know sitting here watching these videos um and we're all hypothesizing because we don't know what we're dealing with and i agree with jim and sean in the sense that it's not one thing it's some overlap of many things but watching that video again i flash back and sean maybe we talked about this when you were on the last time I keep getting this reminiscence of Trevor James Constable's work with the sky creatures and how they were triggering these things with the um, Oregon cannon experiments back in the, what, what the, I guess the early 70s or so. Um, obviously, Wilhelm Reich, who died in 1957, was imprisoned. A lot of his materials were taken. And, and he, you know, it seems to me like Maybe they found out what really lives in the sky and started playing with this either to weaponize it or that this itself, this interaction, which goes into the field of consciousness, may in fact be that these beings, these creatures, these craft, whatever they are, have always been there and the military views them as a threat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very, very possible. You know, if you're not, are you guys familiar with Trevor James Constable at all? Absolutely. Actually, yeah, I spoke to the man once. Okay, right. That's once. what I thought. We did this. <laughs> yeah, we did talk about this. Yeah. I, I bought his book, um, not seeing the cover. And uh, once oh. I realized the cover, it had the triangular craft on there mm -hmm. with the little round thing at the bottom that could be construed as an eye, another one at the top, the, uh, the little pods on the outside engines. It, 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 it's a close match. And I'm like, well, look what we have here. And Trevor did this back in the 50s and 60s where he photographed these things. He, he photographed a lot of things, uh, especially the, what he calls the, um, what is it, the, the blobs, the big round ones. But he also talked about the triangular ones, photographed them and, and some of the others. So uh, I think what we're doing is we're exposing the current military cloaking craft, whether it's simply a blimp or not, and these other things that um, seem to be very connected to natural weather. And uh, so, yeah, I've never uh, had the chance to finish the book. I've, I've flipped through it as much as I can. Uh, a good friend of mine gave me another one. Um, that was a Cosmic Pulse of Life was the one that I bought. And then a friend gave me uh, They Live in the Skies. Yeah, yeah, that's the already, one yeah, that I'm familiar that's it. Yeah, and he had already um, kind of outlined it and, and highlighted it. And I'm, I'm reading that, and I'm like, oh, here we go, here we go. Trevor did this a long time ago, yeah. uh, recently passed. Um, he, he did what he could. I also learned that when he died, he had boxes and boxes of 
infrared film that were never processed. Oh. Yeah. So, um, and I talked to Jose Escamilla about maybe getting hold of these. I, I uh, try to fund it to, to get them developed. That that never happened. But Trevor is, is definitely connected with this. Um, I think he was a great man. I think he was brilliant. And um, I'm happy to hopefully further his research. Well, this seems like a good place for maybe us to take a brief break, give you guys a chance to refresh, and uh, we'll come back on the other side of this, and there's more to come. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the second half of Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The website is offplanetradio.com. With us is Jim Kerr and Sean Goutreau, and uh, we're discussing who, what, whatever is up in the sky. You saw the videos on the first segment of this, and uh, what you're seeing is, is remarkable in the amount of work that both Sean 
and Jim have put into capturing these images and the personal sacrifices that go into that because along the way, one of the casualties in all of this becomes your own sense of grip on reality. So we're going to go back into that. Um, Jim and Sean, we were talking on the break a little bit. The, you, you're, using, you're using modern technology for the most part to capture what's up in the sky right now. We talked a little bit about Trevor James Constable's work, which was obviously done in the 70s, it firmly in the era of analog and film cameras. But the digital cameras now um, there have been an evolving technology. I mean, I've got one here that's close to nine years old now. It's an old um, standard definition. We've gone into high definition. We have more pixels. All of this is being mediated and moderated through um, chip technology. And obviously, film being what it was, was a much more controlled medium. I know because I was a photographer controlled medium in terms of what you could expect in capturing uh, the different wavelengths of light, and especially when you get in infrared. So let's talk a little bit about the equipment you're using and how you're processing and the things that go into making these videos and photographs. Who wants to go first? John, you want to go first? <laughs> no, I was going to ask you. You're the professional. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but well, you know, my my uh, photograph and film and photography started back in the '70s. You know, so I'm used to both analog, uh, you know, both uh, actual film and digital. Now, you know, Sean, both Sean and I, for what we've done, for the main part, you know, we've taken um, basically consumer cameras off the shelf and modified them to be able to uh, capture the full spectrum, you know, light spectrum that the human eye cannot see. And then in addition to that, you could put a lens filter on that will cut out uh, like the like the lower spectrum, the UV, UV cap yeah. capture, capture, you know, into the infrared, you know, that the human eye can't see. So both of us have done that. With myself, you know, at one time, you know, I would, in the morning, I would go out, I had four, Sony uh, camcorders were modified. Some were filming full spectrum. I had them on tripods. I mean, people, if anybody would drive by our property, you know, at one given time, I could have up to seven cameras at different strate strategic locations around the property pointed mm -hmm. to the sky. Uh, they were, all of them had uh, basically a, uh, a capture device, computer capture device, so they could run literally all day long, you know, and, and you know, I would accumulate a lot of uh, footage that way. And then came the time of sitting down and going through the footage. You know, Sean, Sean knows all about that. It's very time consuming. But what I've found, going back to Trevor uh, James Constable, is there is a value to the old school technology. You know, you get into actual film, you know, and uh, uh, actual movie film is too expensive. It's too expensive to have developed and everything else. But, you know, your old 35 millimeter cameras, uh, your medium format cameras, and you start taking photos of the sky uh, using black and white film, uh, you know, and maybe, you know, with like a deep red near infrared uh, lens filter. And it's amazing what you capture here. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up uh, one photograph. And another thing with, with film photography is there's no pixelation. You know, so you could have that, you have that, uh, the negatives develop. Yeah. I, I have an actual professional scanner. So you're shooting 35 millimeter slide, uh, a set like, like ectochrome, ectochrome or. Whatever. I use Ilford, I use Ilford, uh, okay. black and white, you know, just, uh, just, you know, just regular film. Okay. Um, and my this... next, my next step is going into infrared film. In fact, I just had a shipment arrive of actual infrared film, the same film that uh, Constable was using. And, you know, so I'm hoping to, you know, to, to something comes up with that. But let me show you this one photo here. This is with, this is from, uh, this is in uh, black and white film. And see with film, you could zoom in and there's no pixelation. If you look at this here, there's a picture of a craft. Now, there again, I can't say this is a solid object or if I'm catching the reflection off of it or anything else. You can see the left edge here of this object. 
uh, look at looking My at the My God, cop. the definition on that is really clean. The action, the photo this was taken from, I was using a 50 millimeter lens and basically encompassed a quarter of the sky. This this object was literally a dot on the original negative. It was a dot, and this is how far I was able to zoom in on it, you know, using film, and you could see the uh, uh, the plume coming off of this of cloud material. Um, uh, and this isn't the only capture of this that I've made with film. You know, this is the best capture. Uh, let me see if I can pull up another photo of this. And I've added some filters to it. And and it, you could see, you know, you could clearly see there's an object there. Look at the shadow that this is casting on the clouds behind it. You know, there's something here that's actually casting a shadow. You could see the cloud material uh, on the surface of this and with a plume, you know, coming off. Um, is this exactly the same as everything else is up there? I don't know, you know, but uh, I have caught this probably about five different times, you know, on different days, and this is actually the best photo of it. So that is what my next project's going to be using actual infrared film. You know, infrared film, you've got to load it into the camera in a totally dark room, uh, you know, can't be exposed to any light whatsoever, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, just the processing of it is, is critical to have a process. You know, you got to use a really good process and uh, professional processing lab, you know, so who knows? Who knows what I'm going to, you know, come up with anything, you know. See, but, now, for the viewers out there, uh, pixelation is a digital artifact. It has uh, no corollary in film photography. The res the res there is no way to scale resolution with, with analog film photography. The only limitation there is obviously the particle grain of the silver in the emulsion in the film itself, which, again, it has no equation to digital technology. We're up to, what, 4,000 4, pixels per square inch or something like that now. No, definitely. You know, and one thing with modifying cameras, you know, there are companies out there where you could send them a high definition video camera. Uh, you could send them your, your Nikon, you know, whatever, you know, whatever uh, uh, digital camera you have. And, you know, it, it's a little pricey to have it modified. They could modify it for full spectrum. Uh, now, Sean and I both, we modified our cameras ourselves. You know, I mean, they were they were, uh, you know, I bought mine used off of eBay, so if I ruined it, I ruined it type thing. You know, fortunately, the four, the four mm -hmm. that I did turned out okay. You know, basically, you're removing the uh, the UV filter, you know, off the uh, the actual uh, uh, CCD. There's a, there's, a, there's a filter on top of the CCD, which has to be removed. Okay. Sean, I know Sean did the same thing with his cameras. Yeah, I certainly did. Um, when I started noticing what was going on, I think I mentioned I, I bought a, a bunch of cheap little HD cameras just to set outside. Uh, and then I started seeing videos online about people using uh, night vision cameras and picking up things, even in daylight, uh, with certain filters that were not seen yep. with either the naked eye or, or regular camera mode. And um, I think the answer is in infrared, and it makes a lot of sense. And that I think we're dealing with different uh, dimensions in the, the crossover in dimensions is in the heat area, is in the, uh, the high infrared. And it, it kind of goes back to, you know, these ghost stories of cold spots and, and, and draining batteries and, and hot and cold and, and so on and so forth. And I think that explains a lot in this. So, um, uh, yeah, I did alter two cameras. I had one is an old Sony cam I bought in 2002 somewhere around there. And Randy had mentioned about modifying chips. I remember when I bought this camera, um, I was looking into the different specs and I wanted something night vision. I thought that was cool. And I talked to the guy at the store and he said, well, these, these cameras are kind of going bye-bye because um, you can use it to, I think he said like photograph a negative and see through clothes. Yes, so exactly. Like, yeah, you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Now, I actually, know what that is now. I'm holding on to a, uh, a Nikon digital camera I have here specifically for those features because uh, I noticed that now that's all gone away, that they're basically deleting that option from the menus on the cameras. I don't think they took 
the capabilities out. I think they deleted the options from the menus on the cameras. So unfortunately, yeah. what they're doing is now they're limiting that too. You know, the yeah, film's gone because... away and mm -hmm. not many people know how to shoot infrared anymore. And the digital cameras have gotten to the point where they're pretty darn good. And now it looks like they're starting to throttle back the technology so that we, oops, don't see things we're not supposed to see. Yeah, what does that do, Sean? You were about to say what that does. Well, it, it, I, I, I know, I think, where they were going with this. And the whole thing is that if you can view um, ultraviolet and the visual spectrum, there's some clothing, especially bathing suits, that allow UV um, to uh, penetrate the clothing or, or not penetrate the clothing. And, and if it pen penetrates the clothing, then you don't have a tan line, that kind of thing. So, yeah, you could use this technology to see through certain types of garments. What we lost, there we lost your audio there, Sean. Go ahead okay. and back up a little bit. And we were somewhere uh, uh, with the bathing suit analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's ways to see through certain types of clothing, and, and this is the way they put it out there. But what you were saying is, is more to the point, I think, and is that technology is getting so well uh, or so good, we can use it to see these things up there that they're, they're limiting that. And it, it boils down to we humans are designed with what we call visual spectrum, which is somewhere from 360 to about 700 nanometers. Anything below that is UV. Anything above that is mm -hmm. infrared, infrared and beyond. And so I, I know that the connection of uh, the, what we're seeing is is in the infrared spectrum and it really really does help so i modified a couple of cameras one being that sony one of the ones that i bought the cheap ones and that really helped filter out um a lot of the what i call dirty light and and really see what's going on up there that helped tremendously so um yeah and and, and like jim was saying the, there's something with the 35 millimeter film that is more true to it and i think we may have just uh, explain that. Um, I wish I had uh, infrared film to use, um, and I'm planning on getting some some new cameras soon. But uh, infrared. Uh, well, I personally didn't realize. You know, I still have a film camera system here, a Manola system from good grief, the mid 1980s, and it's got me thinking now because I've got long lenses for this camera about getting infrared film. How hard is it to get? Jim, you'd know that. Yeah, it's you could go right to uh, B and H Photo and order okay. infrared film. You know, and the thing is, is even today, if you wanted to get into a high quality Nikon, let's, let's use Nikon for example, you could buy uh, a, a uh, SLR film camera that originally cost five thousand dollars. You could buy them on eBay now. A good, good, you know, low yeah. mile camera. You could buy them for two hundred, two hundred dollars. You know, I've oh, got, I'm not stopping there. I'm going for a Hasselblad medium format camera because I want to shoot. There you go. And I I've know got, they're I know they're going out on the cheap these days. Oh, they are. I've got uh, two medium formats. They're Pentex. One's Pentex six by seven. And the other those one's are Pentex, nice. Pentex sixty seven. You know, now I bought these things dirt cheap. You know, I'm talking less than two hundred dollars. Now the one I did have to put three hundred dollars into it, but the camera's like brand spanking new. You know, and you know, and you you could think if you think about how much you could blow up thirty five millimeter film, you could blow up medium format. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, and the, the you know where I got the idea was was from like the uh, World War Two you know uh, surveillance films cameras they would use on aircraft. Yeah. You know where they could zoom into something you know from from twenty thousand feet, fifteen thousand feet, you know, and, and just incredible resolution. Okay, so, so yeah, go ahead, Emily. Have, have either of you guys? I can't think of his name right now, but if you said it, I'd remember it. Have either of you guys spoken to the guy who makes those night vision goggles, and he invites people to come up and watch with him? And he says that what you will see is like a complete other. It's like he watches warfare essentially going on up there. I can't remember his name. He's kind of a, I can't either, but I know this guy he's is kind of I, a crazy yeah. guy. And he'll, you, I like I heard him on an interview. He's like, I'd rather be a little crazy than a lot stupid. And I, I, I really like that. And and are, are y'all talking about James Gilliland? 
No, I don't think at no. The East Eddie Ranch, no. No, no. This is another. This is a, this is a guy who actually makes the goggles. Oh. He makes them. I know who you're talking about. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it would be really interesting to to track what you guys track with those goggles. It would be, you know. I mean, and there's what's the name of that one camera, Sean? It's a FL. Um, you, you've mentioned it a couple of times. I don't know if it's a heat. You know, oh, uh, the FLIR. The FLIR models. The FLIR models. Yep. You know, yeah. They, they have big, big dollars. You know, I mean, they're big dollars for some of these cameras. But you know what? You don't need to spend that much money. I mean, you could capture you know, stuff with uh, you know, inexpensive cameras. Yeah. I just Can I show you all an example of that? Sure. sure. Yeah. Because um, the main camera I use now, I bought about five years ago. And I went to uh, Zombie Mart, and the manager was smoking crack, apparently, because he put this brand-new model on the shelf on clearance for, for half price. And so I bought it, and I'm like, it's got a 50 times zoom on it. And I realize now that it's kind of overkill. So that's really what I've been using. Oh, there's no such thing as overkill in my world. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, well, the thing is, when the craft come in, sometimes they zoom in too much. And okay, you yeah, yeah. Up to like 30, 40 times zoom yep. to really frame it right so here's some photos i took um just on the seventh of this month and here we go i mean this is the raw shot taken with a cheap camera that can be bought i mean you can buy a what is it a 50 something time zoom with 16 megapixels for 150 bucks the other day so that's what i see i don't use any filters because i don't believe in blocking out any light but what I do is I bring it into my favorite photo editing program and click uh, three buttons, which is like auto levels, and it shows me what's really there. It, um, it, it takes one pixel and makes sure that it's black and another one and makes sure yeah. it's white and then everything. It's, it's not changing it. It's just enhancing it. So when you do that, you get something like that, and you, you realize there's something in the middle. When you flip it, Apparently, it's easier for the human eye to see something that is dark in a light background as opposed to this. When you flip it, you get that. Okay. That's a cloud? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here's another one. That um, original enhanced flip. Wow. Looks like a hand on an x-ray. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, here's another one. Um, let, me, let me get to a really good one because there's a few really good ones down here. This one, raw shot, I knew exactly where to place the object, you know, in the frame. Got it into the computer. Oh, God. Enhance, flip. What's that? That's oh an my. object with a stream behind it. No, that's apparently a cloud. And so I zoomed in on it, did the same thing. You get some better detail. You really start to see, you know, the edges down below and, and yeah. the whole operation, how it works. Isn't that just the whole deal? Like... Any one of these things, if you saw them once or twice, fine. But how could it be that all of these "quote unquote" clouds have a jagged edge, a, a jagged edge, and triangle in them? That's it. I mean, it was finding <laughs> the, that the one right edges. there. That's there's no. Look you can't that. even argue with this one. Boom. How's that's, that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those pizza pizza ones, Sean. That one it looks is, like a pizza yeah, pizza. You can see the crust and everything. My <laughs> pizza. But my whole point is, is like I'm not a professional, and I'm just doing this with a few simple calculations or uh, calculations within my favorite editing program. I'm not changing anything. I'm just enhancing it. And I mean, really? <laughs> Come on. I just, you know, like. You know, when you're little and you drew all, when you draw clouds, I know you drew clouds because you're an artist, and you have these big, puffy, round edged things, right? Like, yep. so just the idea that inside every single one of those at the core of it is a triangle is just hilarious. Yeah. Like, I, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't think that until a few years ago, but once yeah. I started realizing, okay, if all the cumulus, and they are, are generated by triangles. Uh, what about the cirrus clouds? What about this one? What about that one? Yeah, and it's it's really just it, it's crazy. It's it's like a life form. A lot of them in a way. Do you, do you think we have any more of the things that we considered clouds when we were children left? Do you think there is any of that, or are we just looking at an all or mostly generated sky at this point? And that could be the possibility. Um, 
I also leave open the possibility that they're now being exposed or they're kind of exposing themselves. Yeah. Uh, when you start going back to chemtrails and weather modification and, well, cloud seeding, whatever you want to call it, um, you're possibly dealing with barium, strontiums, and other things that are anti-moisture. Right. And what would an anti-moisture um, uh, particulate do to a cloud? It would dry it out. And you'd see yeah. like the skeletal form of what's really going on inside. Yeah, no, again, aluminous oxide, which is one of the one of the strata in the in the chemtrails, uh, is a desiccant. It, it naturally just pulls moisture out of everything that it touches. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, you know, I can't help but think that the interaction between this this chemtrail technology has exposed something that maybe was there all along anyway. Yeah. Again, kind of harking back a little bit to Trevor James Constable and the fact that, you know, they were using at that point Reich's energy and interacting with these things. Now we're seeing them on another scale because all of, the, all of this has been weaponized by the military. Jim? What you do you know, think? Yeah, you know, it, it, that's a possibility. I mean, it's all in the realm of possibility. You know, um, you know, is you know, could this be uh, some sort of life form in itself? Uh, it's a possibility. I, I still don't. I still, for myself, I haven't seen enough evidence of that. Even though I've interviewed people that do believe this, um, but uh, you know, I, for myself, I haven't seen enough evidence of that. You know, you know, mostly what 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 stands out to me is. The you know the military aspect of it, uh, you know, you know with the technology that they're using for uh, you know these plasma clouds, you know the ionization of our atmosphere, uh, you know it, it's just what they're doing to the atmosphere, you know, is destroying the planet. You know it, it's you know our ozone layer is being depleted. Uh, you know it just there's so many possibilities. You know I can't I can't say for sure what. Yeah. So you just kind of opened the door there into like the next place I wanted to go with it, unless somebody else had something to say on where we've already been. And that you, I know, Jim, you have a lot of contact with people who feel that they have, are having contact with the clouds or cloud kind of entities. I've experienced a little bit of this myself. I spoke about it last time Sean was on. Why don't you tell us about what things you have experienced or that people that you've been talking to have been telling you about? About three years ago, um, you know, through some of my articles on uh, the Truth Denied website, you know, I was actually contacted by several different individuals. Um, one in particular, you know, I, I remained in contact with, you know, up until still today. You know, it's been about three, about, right, about three and a half years. Uh, and, you know, he read one of my articles, contacted me, said, hey, you know, this is exactly what I'm seeing you know, with these, these uh, triangular cloud formations up there. And, you know, then he started to tell me that they're alive, you know, and that these things actually communicate, you know, to him. You know, and at first I'm thinking, you know, boy, this guy might be delusional, you know, uh, you know, but the more emails we exchanged, we even spoke a couple of times, you know, the more rational the guy became, you know, and, you know, he, you know, he was claiming that he was actually having conversations, like, uh, you know, not verbal conversations, you know, but like telepathic communication, you know, with these objects and, you know, with these, uh, you know, triangular shapes, you know, and these strange looking clouds. And they would, uh, you know, he was seeking, he, he went and at this point he started trying to seek a higher knowledge. So he was really starting to interact with these, you know, let's call them beings, you know, just for lack of a better term. Okay. And uh, it got kind of scary because in one email he told me that uh, these beings wanted him to join them, you know, but first he needed to commit suicide to join them. And that's when, you know, I thought, you know, boy, you know, this guy, you know, I've got to, you know, try to counsel him. You know, I didn't want to, you know, re reenactment of, uh, 
uh, you know, you know what you see. You know, you see so many different UFO cults. You know, yeah. That, that, yeah, that's uh, the Heaven's Gate cult. Heaven's Gate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. That's Apple, what, Lord Apple White up in Oregon. Right. Yeah. You know, so, and what happened after that? Uh, you know, he's still communicating with these things, but yet he's starting to have additional paranormal things happen to him. He's starting to have problems with poltergeist. He's, you know, everywhere he's turning, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, he's been waking, waking up, you know, with what he, what, he, what he told me was like attempted alien abductions. So whatever he did, whatever happened, you know, he kind of like opened a doorway, you know, to another dimension, I believe. Now, is this for fact, you know, one and the same, these cloak craft? I don't know. You know, I can't say, you know, but uh, he is now at the point, you know, I mean, he was, he'd, he'd call me or email me, say, I need help, you know, refer me someplace, you know, so I was referring him to everybody from, you know, uh, a Christian church that does, uh, that does, you know, uh, house cleanings to uh, Catholic you know, priest that does uh, that's experienced with exorcism. Not that he was possessed, you know, but he was being obsessed. You know, he was being tormented by something, you know. And uh, uh, he, you know, in a, as a recent, you know, it's just gotten worse. But now he's kind of flipped to that these entities are good. You know, there's good entities out there. There's bad entities out there. And you know, I believe that right now he's just. You know, being uh, it's it's like you know we're talking messengers of deception here. You know, we're, we have some entity uh, inter interfering with with us right now. Well, I don't you know. know. We kind of went, you know, sh and Sean, you remember the last time you were on with us? We kind of went there the last time too. That there's a there's an aspect to this where you sense a presence of something, and I mean. It'll freak you out for a while when you think about it, but I've felt pulses coming from these clouds. I mean, I've literally sat and stared at some of them for a couple of hours and sensed an energetic presence there, an intelligence, something beyond an inanimate object or some type of craft, but in fact a presence that has some sort of sentience. And that kind of takes us, I guess, over into the, the you know, the archontic aspect of this, because those, those ancient, those legends, those mythologies, the Gnostic writs have been around for several thousand years now, and they seem to also kind of speak to all of that, that there is this, this presence. I mean, that's what Constable was talking about as well. Yeah, yeah that part scares me. I, I gotta admit, yeah, it and, does. Um, it's very yeah. scary because you know after have your uh, having your head spin for a couple of years and, and not know what to think. Eventually, I opened up to different possibilities and different possibilities, and, and it's just it's it's absolutely maddening. Um, I <laughs> I used to flip these guys off. I'm like, go away, leave me alone. I don't want to see you. I've got to get back to work, kind of thing. Um, but I think that communication is probably not a good idea uh, either because it's, it's uh, not beneficial or we can't understand it or we just can't communicate yeah. in, a, in a certain way. So yeah. observation is great, but yeah. communication for me personally, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I agree with you. Like, I've never made any attempts to communicate with them. What I've noticed is that, when observing them, they sometimes seem to respond. If I'm talking about them with somebody else, they seem to respond. I've never tried to communicate with them. I, I agree with you completely about that. But they seem to um, have some awareness of when they're being observed or when they're being spoken about. And they will then put on sort of like a performance to confirm. Like, to, like we were, so after- I've noticed had, them kind of pulse- Yes, they they or pulse. they seem to move in a certain way that's kind of indefinable because you're going well. Cl clouds don't really back up, but it looked like it was like either contraction or some kind of reverse movement for 
just that brief period of time. What I've experienced is them actually sort of rearranging themselves in accord and almost like uh, making shapes. You know what I mean? Like uh, when I was, you know, the, the clearest example I had of this was I was uh, in Colorado on a granite mountain with somebody and she, I, I was showing these to her because she had never noticed them before. And we started talking and it was like whatever I was saying it would do. And at one point I said to her, if they're alien, they want us to know that they're there. And when I said that, it transformed itself into the thing that looked like a gray. And she was like, she almost crapped her pants. She's like, are you some kind of cloud whisperer or something? And it wasn't me trying to communicate with them, but there was obviously something strange going on. And that isn't the first time that happened, but it was because there was no nothing else in the sky. We were out in nature. There was no other, it was so clear and obvious that that was what had happened. But yeah, no, I don't try and communicate with them. I agree with you on that, Sean. Jim, what do you think? Um, you know, they thrive on attention. Yeah. They thrive on the attention that anybody gives them uh, like a magnet. Uh, you start putting cameras out you know, pointing to the sky, they will show up. You know, I, I mean, I have, I have experienced that you know, numerous times. You know, and uh, I myself won't do any communication with them. You know, I mean, just yeah. based on experiences I've had in the last, you know, 50 years with paranormal things. And, you know, my, my experiences with paranormal started back in high school, you know, when uh, – I was instructed by the Jesuit priests of the Catholic school I went to in the art of uh, astral projection. You know, and ah. it was after that, believe it or not, Jesuit priests, um, it was after that that I saw my first UFO about a week later, I was attacked by an invisible entity, and I could tell you so many stories over the last 40 years that, uh, you know, a paranormal events that, that not only happened to myself, but my wife and my children, too. And... Um, you know, we've never been harmed, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, we've got weapons against that, you know, so to speak. But yeah. uh, they're definitely attracted to attention. There's no doubt about that. You know, another interesting thing, too, that uh, I'll call him Mr. M, the guy that I've been in contact with, you know, for the last three and a half years or so. And I'm just going to read you just a short statement. I won't go through his entire statement, but uh, he states, there are so many questions I have and feel in my gut that I am right about the clouds that contact me. I believe they are artificial intelligence that mm. became self-aware and is not co cooperating with the ways of war. Basic, basically, uh, government is pissed because they spent billions on developing a weapon that can think and adapt and they actually are self-aware now, but decide decided they do not want to hurt people. I mean, that's a statement from a guy that you know he he doesn't follow this that that well. Now, is that a possibility that this is an artificial intelligence that came self-aware? That's something I never thought about before. Sean, has that thought ever crossed your mind? Skynet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> outside of, yeah, outside of Skynet, Skynet you know, but. Yeah. But for somebody that's not a non-researcher, just in a, who has experienced this phenomenon, to come up with that, you know, with that come up with that theory, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. What about this? You know, I don't. This, I, this just kind of occurred to me. But you know, we're we're, in st we're storing ever increasing amounts of information in something they call the cloud, and I have found that they don't call things the, the names they do for just for shits and giggles. There's like always some sort of yep, sub yep. reason. So what if all of these like information being stored up there is actually like program like like what if the, what if the sky is now programmed? Like what if there are artificial intelligence, digital entities, you know, like what if someone or something has figured out how to bring the entity into existence through technology stored in the cloud? That's a distinct possibility. I mean, that is all that is in the realm of possibility. And it's not that we haven't had entities in our skies. You know, we've, you know, I believe we've had them, you know, for, you know, thousands, if not millions of years, these, these entities have been around. You know, they're called by many different names. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. You know, would have, you know, you know, because of our ionized atmosphere, because of all the military experiments, 
the government's doing in our atmosphere that you know something didn't get out of the lab you know what, it, it, what, if, what if even our digital digital footprint or our digital profile because we store things in our computer on the cloud what if that something like that would be enabling this sort of telepathic contact where there seems to be some sort of connection between an individual and something going on in the sky that's possible you know i mean it's it's in the realm of possibilities i mean that's another theory that's actually been brought up in a series of shows i did with uh, dr shamil asher where we talked about uh, the data mining that's been going on and the fact that he's had the sense that they may in fact be using this data to create a replicant of this, not just this world, but each one of us that's in it as a, as sort of a simulated reality. That, that, I, mean, the sense we're, I know we're going way, way out on the rim here, but we have to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's you the think here. about it for a minute. The book of Ezekiel in the in the Old Testament Bible that talks about these these strange things in the in the sky that he's seeing as wheels within wheels. I mean, this so, isn't new. So we're talking about like the sentient world simulation kind of creation, right? Yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, you know, none of that's new. I mean, if you look in uh, biblical terms, you know, um, you know, I, I am I am not a religious person. You know, I don't belong to a church. You know, but I, I do consider myself a Christian. I've done a lot of research. You know, biblical research, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, these entities have been around for millennia. Yes, I mean, yes. Like you mentioned the Book of Ezekiel. I mean, there's some pretty, you know, what Ezekiel saw. And how he described it was something pretty wild. That's now, an acid trip right there. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and that's that's not the only one. No, I mean, it's you know, not. You know, and just if you just talk about angels only, you talk about angels. You know, you're talking about a being that is so powerful. You know, and of course, it's not a god. You know, it, it's it's a servant of God. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Angels yep. are basically messengers. You know, messengers, and they will do, you know, what God commands them to do. But they can appear to you, and you'll never know that you're, 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 ta you're speaking with an angel. You'll never know it. You know, they'll, or they can intervene. I mean, I have had experiences, multiple experiences, the same with my wife, where something intervened. Something intervened and stopped something from happening. I actually saw, I visually saw time stop. Oh yeah! I'm uh -huh. completely stopped. Oh. I was, I was Here we with, go, Em. <laughs> yeah. I, I was with. I was driving down 138, yep. which is a two-lane highway known for many fatal accidents. Um, there, there was one road where they actually shut this road down. There were so many. You know, somebody would be making a left turn to head, say, uh, uh, east. You know, well, I was traveling west on this road, and this road is gone now. This car darted out in front of me. I had my wife and three kids were all sound asleep in the vehicle. They didn't witness this, right? This thing darted out in front of me, and I was looking at the side of the guy's head. I was driving a, a, a Chevy a one-ton pickup truck, crew cab. I was looking at the side of his head. Now, I'm a retired California Highway Patrol officer, so I know, you know, what's going to happen in an accident. Yeah. This guy's car is five feet in front of my vehicle. I'm at 65 miles an hour, right? We're going to hit. I mean, we're talking, yep. we're talking nanoseconds here, right? All of a sudden, it was, I, I, it's hard to explain what happened. It was, it's almost like, like a, a section of videotape. Was that was out. placed. Yep. It, was, it was removed from the Yeah. It was Emily? <laughs> yep. We've had this conversation. We've, yes. We've, yeah, we've, we've had this, this exact yeah. conversation. It was removed from the timeline. The next thing I know, I'm looking in my rear view, my right side rear view mirror, and I see the guy's taillights. I should have hit him. I should have hit this guy. And it never happened. You know, so... You know, there, there's things there's things that happen involving angelic beings. Yeah. You know, where they're either messengers. I, I you know, I, I could go on literally for two hours. Well, you know, and th that was it. When you're describing this, I could have completed your sentences, Jim, because I've had those experiences at least twice. 
And I've had experiences where I've sat in a room and watched time not only stand still, but actually reverse. Or, and, and, and reverse and speed up in the same time frame. So we're not talking about things here that it's like, oh, I think that happened. It was like, no, this happened over a long enough period of time that it was palpable. And uh, it's, you know, we could do an entire show on this subject. You know, but you were talking about this, and it's interesting, because even in the New Testament, there's the prophecy in the book of Luke, which says, this same Jesus which you saw will come once again in the clouds. And, you know, that's always, especially since this whole cloud thing has kind of occurred, I'm kind of like thinking there's something more about clouds than just just these fluffy things in the sky. There's something else. It's it's probably both a metaphor and it's also perhaps even a storage medium. No, I, I agree. I mean, there is, you know, in the Bible, I can't remember how many times clouds, clouds are mentioned. It's all over the place. Yeah, it's all. There's so many events. You know, Jesus is going to return in the clouds. He left in the clouds. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just, it's, you know, and I've always said, it's all happening in the sky. That's one of my favorite sayings. It's all there, man. <laughs> it, it, it's all happening in the sky, and it, it just, it's mind blowing. You know, and. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not thumping on the Bible. Or no, anything. I'm not either. People no, no. know that. I know. Yeah, you know, no but, Bible thumping here. I won't no. allow. <laughs> but, but, but you know, if you look at all the prophecies, like 30 percent of the Bible is prophecy, mm -hmm. and it's the only document in history where, so far to date, all the prophecies have been fulfilled 100 percent. Yeah. You know, uh, no, 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 Thomas can't say that. I mean, it, it's just, it's the only one. So for me, you know, I look for a lot of answers there, you know, and also alternate biblical, you know, biblical text, you know, like the book of Enoch. And yes, 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 absolutely. You know, but, and like you said, this could be a, you know, I'll stop here because this could be a subject for an entirely different show. And but we may have that conversation. We may have, we may have it, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I could go on for hours of events similar to this, this time thing where it's mind-blowing. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing, you know. But that, we, you know, we're back to the the subject of folk folk craft. <laughs> yeah. So where do we want to take this? Time is, as Sean said, two hours goes fast. I'm watching the clock go zoom. So let's let's. Uh, so, where do we want to hit it? Well, Sean, Sean uh, if, if you have something else you want to say about the sky, Sean, uh, let me know. But if not, I just because you know I've enjoyed chatting with both of you guys about a number of topics and we seem to be living in absolute insanity right now. I would kind of like to get your perspectives on the things going on in the world that aren't in the sky because yeah. you guys have eyes to see something most people can't. What are you seeing in the things that everyone is talking about? Well, I, I you know, nowadays I kind of laugh uh, about what's going on uh, <laughs> on Parapharma because <laughs> what's going on above is so much more interesting yeah. Yeah. that anybody can see. And it's been going on for years. And, you know, I'll walk outside now and it's like looking through the matrix. It's just, you can see, I can see them just the you can way see it are. glitch. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like it pixelates. Right through it. And it's yeah. like, okay. And then you see what's on TV and this is happening here and this is going on. It's like, whatever. Is it connected? It very well could be. But I find it. Y'all still there? We're yeah. here. We're here. We're here. We, can hear, we, we can hear you, Sean. Okay. It said I got cut off. Um, yeah. Essentially, I just get a bigger kick out of what's going on up above than anything that happens in, in politics and you know, whatever it may be in, in, in the world. Um, but I'd like to go back briefly to what y'all were talking about. There's things yeah. in the Bible that are um, correlating with what we've studied, and I find that extremely interesting. But we can also talk about different cultures in the past to have talked about their gods coming out of the sky, coming out yep. of the clouds. The Hindu Vimanas. There's uh, so much. Yeah. Vimanas, Vedas, all of that. I think it's yeah. all connected. I really do. Yeah. And what about, I mean, have you, I don't know, I think about this sometimes. You know, Randy and I have spent a lot of time talking about quote unquote secret space program and the problem with the secret space program and the multiple problem with the secret space programs. And the longer that these conferences and people talking about it go on, 
with them not paying any attention to your work, Sean, like to me, yeah, that 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 is the biggest evidence that there is a problem. Because in my opinion, you ha- if there if there is a secret space program, you have documented more evidence of it than any of the people who are going around telling so everybody about whistleblowers. It. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Sean? Well, I've got some opinions on um, people like that and I don't want to be negative, but I'll just say I'm not impressed. You can be, you can be yeah, frank. Yeah, okay. Be frank. I'll be frank. Anybody who mentions Roswell or a book yep. about Roswell, you know, forget it. How far are we going to get with that? That was, you know, 70 something years ago. What's going on right now up above everyone is, is very pertinent, very interesting. And I think we should be talking more about that, but you know, um, it, it's getting there slowly, uh, more slowly than, you know, I'd like, or anybody would like, but it's happening. The information cannot be stopped. And, um, whether this, uh, interview reaches people or, or not, people will start seeing these more and more. And they have. And and that's the, the beautiful part about it is um, putting the information out there and getting contacted by somebody who came across, uh, you know, our work, Jim's work, yep. Omic, Belfast Bap, anybody, and said, uh, you know, thank you for doing this because we thought we were crazy. And we've been seeing this for years. My, my family thinks I'm nuts and, and so on and so forth. Thanks for the help. No, it's almost a mark of, of valor now that your family thinks you're nuts. I mean, that, that seems <laughs> yeah, to be like, like a club we're in. <laughs> yeah. It is, but it, it, it's getting there. Bit by bit. Yeah, so on that, uh, on that note, uh, before we do actually run the clock down, does, did we have a new video, Sean, that you wanted to show us? Something new? No, it was just the, the photographs that I showed you all the other day, okay. from the other day from five days ago and uh, what I'm getting into now and, and just how to show them a little bit better. And I've gotten uh, a, a more positive response by especially doing the inverse technique than, yeah. than the old It method. is easier to see. And also, Sean, just haven't since the last time that you were on, I know last time you were on, we spoke about your photograph of the lightning strike. Haven't since that time you confirmed that there was a triangular craft in that photograph? There's a triangular craft. There's a rod that is 30 feet long and there's multiple other objects in that photograph that I brushed off as paper flying around. I I just didn't know, but now I know a lot more. I can realize that that lightning photograph hitting the world trade center that I took in Can you July. throw that? Is there a chance you can throw that up on the screen? Do you have that handy? Let me see if I can dig it up. And this, the, that would be a good visual for people who would, because the, the people see that. I, I think that's one of your more com, most compelling images, personally. I mean, I saw it, it took my breath away. That, um, my yeah. memories of the World Trade Center are so, I guess, burned into my brain. That, I, just, I just knew the first time I saw that. Before long, before you could, were able to figure that out, I knew that somehow that that photograph was connected to you being the person that would just dis- that discovered these triangular. That, that right there, uh, and, and y'all serious, see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Seriously, when I look at that, it does something. I I just get. Yeah, when I first saw that, I knew that it was no mistake that you were the guy who 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 do the does this spotting of the triangular and i don't know how i knew that where can you is could you have the image where you can show people where it is um no because this is a low res version but i can tell you up at the top can you see my cursor yes yeah, the, whole thing? The, the rod is up here and it's curved and it seems like the uh bolt is actually coming around it there's another craft when you zoom in along this side, and that's the triangular one. Right there, I see it. Yeah. Okay, and then on this side, before right I essentially airbrushed them out, this whole section over here is little white objects all over the place. So, yeah, it this was... This goes a long way towards something Emily and I have talked about, and it's, it's our, kind of our common opinion, that whatever else was going on with the World Trade Center that particular location there and perhaps the building itself was some kind of portal system that in fact, that's why they can't build another high rise in that location. There is wild ass speculation for you. Yeah, yeah, no, we talked about this on the last show <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, um, portal work. 
World Trade Center? I, I, I don't know. But when I revisited that photograph and looked at it again and knowing what I know now, I'm like, boom, boom, boom. There it is. There's something there. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our world. It's, it's wild and weird. Guys, we're, uh, we're kind of getting to the end here, and this has been so much fun. Um, I've gotten, you know, kind of a head rush from all of this. Anything else we want to we wanna catch up with here before we back out tonight? We may have to do another show. I know. I know oh, I know. Not. We're going to. I can tell yeah. you right yeah. now. I've decreed it. Yeah. I, I've got more video footage and photos, and I know Sean does too. And I think this is a great medium to bring this stuff out, you know, because uh, I agree. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah. And Jim, we can have you back to talk about some of these other paranormal yeah. time anomalies. Yeah, I, I'd love to. I mean, I, I could go on for between my son's experiences. My wife has had some wild experiences. My daughter, uh, myself, you know, since I was, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, I mean, wild wild stuff like actually you know like seeing my father's restaurant and bar burn in a vision uh the day before it happened i mean just wild stuff i mean crazy yeah that's what that stuff's up our alley so yeah we'll have to have you back for that and maybe you know we'll do this again with both of you maybe sometime we'll also invite uh ilana to join us and we'll just go crazy on the sky there you go we'll put a panel together put a panel together we'll just rock and roll that sounds great all right thank yeah. you all right, guys. Thank thanks so much for for what you presented. Uh, won't be the last time. And Hang on uh, the line for a second when we're done. Yeah, we're gonna back out of here um, again. This is Off Planet Radio. The website is offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer, and our guests Jim Kerr and Sean Gutrell. And we'll be back with another show very soon because we're loading them up right now. The truth is out there. It's inside you.